Can we get good candy trick or treating? Nobody got any good candy trick or treating? I had a bunch of students said they're going to come by and trick or treat at my house. Nobody came and trick or treated my house. I'm going to be really rough on you guys today as a result of this. Okay? You can say we can trick or treat at your house. You can. You could. I had a I had a pile of candy this high. I had four little children came by. Yeah, they hate me now. I mean, the, their mothers do. I. Well, no, I didn't do it. What? No, no, it's in my office. So if you want, to, you have to come to my office to get it now. So <laughs> you come to my house tonight, I will be in a bad mood. So. Okay. So um, hope everybody's um, on top of things. There's the approximate distribution of, of the uh, grades, and you can see about where you stand with respect to grades in the class. So hopefully, people are better off than they thought they were. Uh, but I still want everybody to work on where you hope to be. And so please do uh, stay in touch with me about that. So that's important that I can help you as much as I can. Okay. Now, um, last time I talked about ATCAs. And I talked about the fact that ATCAs um, is an important regulatory enzyme. One of the things I probably didn't say is that not all enzymes are regulated. Okay. Not all enzymes are regulated. In fact, the vast majority of enzymes are not regulated. And you might think, well, Kevin, that flies in the face of what you were telling us earlier, that cells have to get these Maseratis under control. But there's other ways of getting Maseratis under control besides the direct uh, things that we're talking about here. One of these is availability of substrate. The substrate, if the substrate's not available, the enzyme can sit there all at once, and it's not going to do a darn thing. So if I control the first enzyme in a metabolic pathway, I can control what substrate is available for the pathway. So that's a very, very powerful thing. So controlling this first enzyme of a pathway is a very common scheme for controlling an entire pathway. Very common scheme for controlling an entire pathway. Okay. And this mechanism that I described, which was feedback inhibition, that is used um, in the case of a, a, an end product of a pathway feeding back and inactivating or reducing the activity of an enzyme is a very common uh, pathway, a very common control mechanism that we will talk about. Now, um, I say this because I, now I'm going to talk about something that's related, but it's also different. Okay? So, you remember I talked about, when I talked about chymotrypsin, I said biochemists are basically lazy people. And they like to have things in the simplest possible way that they can uh, to understand them. And so biochemists do a lot of things with artificial substrates that uh, allow them to study an enzyme. And one of those artificial substrates I'm getting ready to describe is a compound known as PALA, P-A-L-A. P-A-L-A is a compound that, there it is right there, that looks like aspartate, at least as far as ATCase is concerned. It looks like aspartate. Okay? Well, it's not aspartate, but it does bind to the enzyme. In fact, PALA is a suicide inhibitor of the enzyme. It will bind at the, the, uh, the catalytic site where aspartate would bind. Now, why do we care about that? Well, one of the reasons we care about that is when people studied PALA, they discovered something interesting about ATCase. And it was, the, it was actually the use of PALA that helped elucidate this structure thing that I'm going to describe to you. It turns out that when PALA is bound to ATCase, the enzyme is locked, locked in the R state. It's locked in the R state. And you might say, well, wait a minute now. R state, doesn't that mean the more active form of the enzyme? And you just told me it's a suicide inhibitor. It is a suicide inhibitor. The enzyme is not active. However, the enzyme is locked in a different configuration. It has a different form. It was with Pala that we were able to determine that R state was a different physical form. It has a different physical form than the T state does. We can actually show this by centrifugation because when we put these two things into a centrifuge, we discover that this guy travels at a different rate than this guy does. This guy travels faster. It's more compact. Okay? I'm sorry. This guy travels faster. It's more compact. The, the, sorry. I'm pointing at the wrong one. 
Our state is, is bigger. It's more, it's more open. It's more exposed. Okay? Now, these guys, uh, prior to that realization, okay, it wasn't really understood what ATCAs was doing with respect to R state and T state. And the reason why was that the enzyme tends to predominantly be in the T state. If it's just sitting around doing nothing, it tends to be in the T state. So if you look for a structural difference, let's say, OK, I want to see which of them are in R and which of them are in T. Basically, if you don't have anything else in there, you're going to see enzymes in the T state. Okay? Well, that turns out to be important because it actually gave us clues on how enzymes turn from T state to R state and back to the T state. Okay? So I'm going to discuss a couple mechanisms for you, one of which we've sort of talked about already, but I haven't specifically uh, shown to you. So. Um, Think about hemoglobin. In the case of hemoglobin, we had uh, a situation I described where we had four subunits. We have binding of oxygen by one subunit causes its interaction with the other subunits to change. And that causes those, I'm going to close that door. Yeah, thank you. OK. That causes those subunits to change. All right. So in this case, in the case of hemoglobin, we see that change of one subunit causes the second subunit to change, which in turn causes the third subunit to change, which causes the fourth to change. So we see a sort of a cause effect. Okay? We see a cause effect. All right. Now, in the case of ATCAs, we see a different mechanism uh, that's in place. Okay? And that mechanism, actually, uh, okay. Before I say ATCAs, let me finish up the um, uh, hemoglobin. So hemoglobin has um, a, um, um, a conversion that we think of as sequential. The first one causes the second one, causes the third one, causes the fourth one to change. Okay? We see a cause effect for that. ATCAs appears not to do that. Okay? ATCAs does not have a cause and effect. That is, one causes the second, causes the third, causes the fourth, causes the fifth, causes the sixth to change. Instead, ATCAs appears to exist completely in the T or completely in the R. Okay? And what the allosteric effectors do is it locks the enzyme in one of those states. Now, I haven't said how they change yet. I'll say that in a minute. So, for example, CTP, which allosterically inhibits the enzyme, will lock the enzyme when it binds to it in the T state. ATP, which allosterically activates the enzyme, will lock the enzyme in the R state. We clear on that? Yes. So CTP, which inhibits the enzyme, when it binds to it, will lock the enzyme in the T state. ATP, which allosterically activates the enzyme, will lock the enzyme in the R state when it binds to it. OK? Now, the question then is, well, how does the flip from T to R occur? And it's thought that it occurs irrespective of the binding of substrate. Irrespective of that. That is, the, the flipping is something that it just naturally goes through. It naturally goes from T to R and from R to T. Since T is preferred, it ends up being in the T state more frequently. Oh, that's, that's still not what I want. Okay. This equilibrium, you see this flipping that goes on back and forth, okay, right here, is going on without anything in the enzyme. There's no substrate that's causing it. There's no allosteric effector that's causing it. The enzyme is capable of flipping back and forth between T and R without anything else that's there. And that flipping is complete. It's a concerted mechanism. So we call this the concerted mechanism of catalysis. In the concerted mechanism of catalysis, the flipping is not a cause and effect. It's simply a property of the enzyme. There's no cause effect. It flips from T, it flips to R. All that the allosteric effectors do is they lock it into one state versus the other state. Yes, ma'am? The uh, T state and R state, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would use the word unstable, but it's certainly capable of flipping, if that's what you mean by unstable, yes. 
I don't want to say it's unstable and have people think it's going to fall apart because it's not going to do that. Um, I didn't describe uh, hemoglobin's T state as unstable, no. No. Okay. So, flipping. So, that if I were to ask you on an exam the major difference between the concerted model and the sequential model of catalysis, okay, the sequential model of catalysis has a cause and effect. Binding of a molecule causes a change. The concerted effect, there's no cause and effect. The flipping from R to T is not brought about by the binding of a molecule. It's brought about simply by the enzyme itself. Now, this flipping prefers the T state. So how do you ever get things very much in the R state? Well, imagine, if you will, that you flip maybe one in 50 of these guys, or maybe even less than that on, on average. I think it's about one in 80, something like that. Okay, One in 80 flips to the R state. Once you get it in the R state, you lock it there with a substrate. Then 1 in 80 of these flips again, and it locks. 1 in 80 flips again, and it locks. Eventually, you can flip everything into the R state if you have the time and you have the amount of, subs uh, the amount of allosteric effector to bind to it. Okay? Does that make sense? Question back there. Yes, sir? Yeah, the polymolecule molecule will bind to it in the R state and, and, and freeze it right there. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, poly is not very uh, actively binding at that state. I, I, don't, I don't know the full answer to that, but I don't believe it will bind very much, no. Yes, ma'am? Like nope. Poly is covalently bound. It's a suicide inhibitor. Okay. So the TAs, I gave them today an exercise they're going to lead you through with respect to Paula and thinking about um, R and T states of the molecule. And they're going to give you something a little surprising. So uh, take your, put your thinking caps on when you go to recitation this week, and you'll have a chance to think about um, how we might do something with an enzyme. OK. Uh, T state, blah, blah. R state, blah, blah. OK. OK. All right, so that's pretty much what I want to say about ATCAs. Uh, I think I've pretty much exhausted that one. Let's move forward and talk about uh, another interesting enzyme known as protein kinase A. I'm not going to talk about lactate dehydrogenase. Your book inserts that there almost as if it's a, ran a random place to put it in, and it's not really relevant for the things that we're talking about. So I want to talk about protein kinase A. Protein kinase A, you're going to hear a lot about the rest of this term. Protein kinase A is one of the most important enzymes in the cell for a process known as signaling, okay? Signaling. Signaling uh, is a uh, process whereby information is communicated, in this case, within the confines of a cell. And that information is communicated by action of an enzyme. The enzyme catalyzes the phosphorylation, that is the addition of phosphate, to other proteins. So its name, protein kinase, tells us, first of all, what it does. Protein kinase A, there is a B, et cetera. Right, but protein kinase A, a kinase is an enzyme that adds phosphates, and a protein kinase is an enzyme that adds phosphates to other proteins. Now, the addition of phosphates to other proteins has drastic effects on those proteins. It may, for one thing, it's changing the charge. Okay. So changing the charge, you might expect, is going to change shape. And when we start changing shape of enzymes or proteins, we start changing function. And that's exactly what happens. So these additions of phosphate that protein kinase A is catalyzing are very important for controlling enzymes, controlling what proteins do. All right. This is the first example that you will see of covalent modification of enzymes. So we've talked about allosterism. Allosterism, allosterism was when a small molecule bound to a protein and favored the um, uh, protein going more active or less active, that is changing its activity. I said there were three mechanisms. The second mechanism we're going to talk about now is covalent modification. Okay? So protein kinase A participates in the covalent modification 
of enzymes. Well, how does it work? Well, protein kinase A is an interesting compound. Protein kinase A, uh, as we will see, has regulatory subunits and it has catalytic subunits. So it's a scheme that's not unlike what we see with uh, ATCAs, but there's a significant difference, and we'll, we'll see that in a second also. Why do I show you this molecule on the screen? Well, it turns out this molecule on the screen is an allosteric activator of protein kinase A. It's an allosteric activator. This is one case where an allosteric activator is a complete on switch. And when it's absent, it's a complete off switch. It's one of those rare times in allosterism where we see complete on and off, and you'll see why that's the case in a minute. Okay? This guy binds to the regulatory subunit of protein kinase A and causes the enzyme to become active, as I'll show you in a second. Now, this compound is a very interesting compound. You're going to hear a lot more about it in the rest of the term as well. It's known as cyclic AMP, or CAMP, as you see here. It's very much like AMP, except for it has a ring out here. That phosphate is bound to two things, making a ring in CAMP. It's only bound to one thing if it's AMP. So that's the difference between cyclic AMP and AMP. In higher cells especially, although even in lower cells, um, cyclic AMP is a, an important molecule in the phenomenon of signaling. Okay? So I want to emphasize that. It's a very, very important molecule in the phenomenon of signaling, and one of the reasons it's important is because of what it's doing to protein kinase A. Okay, how does it work? Well, here's the way it works. You see on the screen, protein kinase A is a dimer of dimers, all right? Meaning a dimer means two identical copies. So here's a catalytic subunit linked to a regulatory subunit. Here's another catalytic subunit linked to a regulatory subunit. You can see the two regulatory subunits sort of connected to each other, and it holds everything together, as you see here. What you see in the figure shown on the left of the screen is that there is, in fact, the enzyme in the, act, in the inactive state. That is, the regulatory subunit is bound to the catalytic subunit. The regulatory subunit covers up the catalytic site. And it's for this reason that the enzyme is completely turned off when there's no cyclic AMP. The catalytic site is physically covered by the regulatory subunit. The substrate cannot get, in, the substrate cannot get into the catalytic site when there's no cyclic AMP. When cyclic AMP is present, it binds to the regulatory subunit and it induces a change in the structure of the regulatory subunit such that it gets released from the catalytic subunit and the catalytic subunits then can bind to the substrate and they do their thing. They start putting phosphates onto proteins. Okay, that makes sense? All right, now, kinases put phosphates onto proteins. If you remember back to when I talked about amino acids, I said there are three amino acids that can be phosphorylated, and I'll repeat them for you here so you don't forget, because they're important. They're the three amino acids that have hydroxyl groups. That includes threonine, serine, and tyrosine. Some enzymes are specific for one versus the other. This enzyme favors putting phosphates onto serine and threonine. It does not put phosphates onto tyrosine. In fact, we're going to see that tyrosine phosphorylation is a very important uh, process that occurs in the signaling that tells the cell to divide. This is not telling the cell to divide. It's telling the cell to do some other things, although ultimately it may tell the cell to divide as well. So other enzymes that put phosphates onto tyrosines of proteins are known as tyrosine kinases. And we'll talk about them uh, later when I talk specifically about signaling processes. But for right now, I'm just focusing on protein kinase A and how it is regulated. Now, that's what the story with that. Questions about protein kinase A? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's both, both. It'll put on both. Mm -hmm. Okay. So.
So that's protein kinase A. Protein kinase A you're going to hear a lot about, as I said. Um, nah, I don't want to say that. Um, one of the things that the um, regulatory subunits are doing is they're actually, as I said, they're physically covering up the catalytic site. And what they're doing is they're plugging it up with something that looks like a substrate, but it's not. And it's not a suicide. That is, it's not covalently bound. It's just sticking this thing that looks like a substrate into the active site and keeping the enzyme from doing anything. So only when cyclic AMP is present does that artificial substrate come out of the active site and allow the, en the enzyme to become active. Okay. Well, uh, there are other different, there are other modifications or other covalent modifications that occur to enzymes that we need to talk about. And um, I'll, I'll mention them briefly. Um, your, your book mentions a couple that really aren't enzymes. <laughs> that is, they're modified proteins, not enzymes. Um, and I'll mention them here because your book also mentions them. The first of those is acetylating lysine. This is a reaction that occurs commonly on important proteins in chromosomes known as histones. Chromosomes are composed of DNA plus some very positively charged proteins known as histones. Okay. Your chromosomes, when you see a chromosome in a microscope, is full of DNA and histones. There's more histones there than there is DNA. The histones help the DNA to wrap up to fit inside the confines of the cell. The histones are very positively charged. They're attracted to the negatively charged DNA, and they, they facilitate the coiling up, the wrapping up of that DNA. One of the ways that cells activate transcription, we'll talk about this next term, but one of the ways in which they activate transcription is they cover up the negative charges on the histones. When you cover up the negative charge by adding an acetyl group to it, like you see here, what was a positively charged lysine becomes neutrally charged. Yes, I'm covering up the positive charge. Did I say negative? I'm sorry. So I'm covering up the po sorry. I'm covering up the positively charged lysines. Okay. So histones are positively charged. If I cover up that positively charge, then it's no longer nearly as attracted to the negatively charged DNA as it was. Okay. That means that the histones have loosened up. And when I loosen those up, I allow RNA polymerase to come in and make RNA much more easily. Okay? So this acetylation reaction of lysines is very important for helping to control gene expression. We'll talk a lot more about that next term. Okay. The specific reactions uh, that are catalyzed by um, uh, protein kinase A are shown here. ATP is the source of phosphate. The uh, side chain, uh, which has an OH group, serine, threonine, or tyrosine, not in the case of protein kinase A, but other protein kinases can do that. We see a phosphate getting attached, and we're left behind with ADP. Okay? So that's the reaction that we're talking about. All the phosphorylations we'll be talking about require ATP. Oh, that wasn't what I wanted. I screwed that up, didn't I? Okay. All right. So um, kinases that put phosphates onto things are very, very important because they control some amazing things inside of cells. All right. You see that there are different molecules that participate in this signaling process. I'm not going to go over these right now. I will talk about them later. But suffice it to say that the signaling process relies on small molecules that are able to move quickly through the cell. All right. All these guys on the left are small molecules compared to proteins or nucleic acids. So it's important that we have uh, that, those small molecules uh, as part of our signaling process. Okay. Well, I talked about phosphorylation. What about dephosphorylation? Is that something that's important? And the answer is absolutely yes. Because, as I like to, just like to say, cells are control freaks. If they want to have a switch to turn on, they also want to be able to turn that switch off because cells have needs. There's a reason they turn the switch on. If there's a reason they turn the switch on, you can bet there's a reason they, they turn the switch off. Okay? So enzymes called kinases put phosphates on. Different enzymes called phosphatases take phosphates off. Okay? 
Phosphatases take phosphates off. Okay? So here's a protein phosphatase. A protein phosphatase, as its name would suggest, is taking phosphates off of proteins that have phosphates on them. And as a consequence, we regenerate that OH group and we release a phosphate. Okay? So phosphatases are very important for reversing the processes. Very important for reversing some of the processes that we'll be talking about. Okay. Now, the next set of covalent modifications that I want to talk about, and we may actually finish early today, are the zymogens. Okay? Zymogens are um, interesting, inactive forms of proteins that are made. They're interesting, inactive forms of proteins that are made. Well, why would we want to make inactive forms of proteins? Well, again, this is allowing cells another level of control. And I'll give you a real good example. Okay? So, we make uh, digestive enzymes. That is, our uh, pancreas uh, in particular is very active in making proteases. And proteases, you recall, of course, are enzymes that break peptide bonds. They break proteins down. And that's very important for the process of digestion. Because if I eat a meal and it's got protein in there, I really want to use the amino acids that are in that protein to make my own proteins. That requires, therefore, that I break down the proteins that are there. So my pancreas makes many digestive enzymes, many protease enzymes that break down those proteins. Well, that's fine and dandy, except for the fact that the pancreas has cell membranes that are loaded with proteins. So if the pancreas is making proteases that break down proteins, won't the pancreas eat itself? And the answer is it can. Okay? So the pancreas releases what are called zymogens. Zymogens are inactive forms of proteins, in this case proteases. And these zymogens go into the intestinal system where they become activated. So they don't hang around the pancreas and chew up the pancreas. Now, what can happen is sometimes they can get activated too soon. That is, they can get activated before they make it into the digestive system. And when that happens, the enzymes do indeed start chewing up pancreatic cells. It causes a condition known as pancreatitis. It's very painful. It can, in some cases, be fatal. Has anybody here ever had pancreatitis? Your cat has pancreatitis. Is it going to pull through? Uh, probably not. Pro oh. She's 16, she has hypothyroidism and Oh, that's no fun. Pancreatitis is very painful. And it, as I said, it can be fatal. Um, it's usually reasonably treated these days. There are protease inhibitors that can do that. But um, especially as you get older, you're much more prone to pancreatitis. And what's happening is that the enzymes that are doing the activating are starting to back up back into the area where the pancreas is and cause that problem. Okay? So I usually have one or two people in the class who've had pancreatitis, but obviously nobody uh, here who's had it. Okay. Well, zymogens. So zymogens are inactive forms of enzymes. Most commonly they are proteases, but it's not absolute. Most commonly they are proteases. Zymogens are inactive forms. The active forms will have a different name that's related to the zymogen form, okay? So, for example, pepsinogen is the inactive form. Pepsin is the active form of this protease that works in our stomach. Chymotrypsinogen is the precursor of chymotrypsin. Trypsinogen is the precursor of trypsin. Procarboxypep, there went, we, we broke the rule, okay? Procarboxypeptidase was the pre, is the precursor of carboxypeptidase. Proelastase is the precursor of elastase, okay? In general, I want you to know that OGEN, O-G-E-N on the end, if you see that, that means, in fact, that it, it is a zymogen. Okay, they've changed the nomenclature. Pro can mean a lot of different things, so I'm not going to expect you to know which ones are zymogens and which ones aren't zymogens, et cetera. Okay? But O-G-E-N on the end does indicate a zymogen always. All right, well, so these guys are... Uh, made in an inactive form so they can get into the intestinal system and do their work. And you're sitting there thinking, well, okay. So they don't digest the pancreas, 
But what about my intestines? My intestines have proteins and so forth in them. Aren't they going to have a problem? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And in fact, they will. Your intestinal tissue is some of the most rapidly regenerating tissue in your body. It's there with that understanding that it's going to do that. Okay? It's going to do that. Now, you might think, well, that's really an odd way to go about it, and it is a bit of an odd way to go about it. And I have a bit of a story with that for you. All right? The story is that there are some people who are very sensitive to things like aspirin. Okay? Very sensitive to things like aspirin. And they uh, associate stomach problems, or intestinal problems, ulcers, and so forth with taking aspirin because some people have to take aspirin fairly routinely for pain uh, treatment. All right? And for many years, everybody said, oh, well, that aspirin's got all that acid in it and so forth. That's why you got that problem. And people said, well, how could a little tiny tablet of aspirin cause so much acid? I mean, the stomach is just loaded with, the, with acid, the concentration of hydrochloric acid, concentrated hydrochloric acid. How can this little aspirin tablet affect the acid content? That doesn't make any sense. They went out and they made buffered aspirin. So didn't have all those properties. And it's still, people taking aspirin have these problems. Okay? So why do some people taking aspirin have this problem? It, it, problem? it turns out, we'll talk a little bit about it next term, that aspirin inhibits production of molecules known as prostaglandins. You don't need to know this. I'm just telling you a story. I'll tell you. Ne next term, you'll be responsible for this. Something to look forward to. Okay? Prostaglandins turn out to do a variety of things. And one of them is they stimulate the production of intestinal tissue. So if you're taking aspirin for a long period of time, some people, not all people, but some people will have stomach problems associated with that because they're not producing intestinal um, tissue as rapidly because they're not making prostaglandins necessary for that. And as a consequence, they develop sores, ulcers, and so forth because the, the, of the digestion that's actually occurring of their own intestines by some of the proteases. Okay. There's other things involved in ulcers. There's bacteria involved in ulcers as well. So I don't want to leave the impression this is the only way ulcers can form. OK, that's a uh, end of story. OK, so um, what do I want to say here? Not much. That was, that was easy. Throw that one out, right? OK, let's talk about chymotrypsinogen. Here's our friend, the precursor of our good friend, chymotrypsin, that you've already heard something about. Trypsinogen is made in an inactive form. It's made by the pancreas for the reasons I've already stated. Okay. And its activation requires action of an enzyme known as trypsin. Trypsin is in the active form, excuse me, in the um, uh, intestine. Okay. And trypsin, when it encounters chymotrypsinogen, will cleave a single peptide bond between amino acids 15 and 16. A single peptide bond. That causes chymotrypsinogen to be converted into something called pi-chymotrypsin. And pi-chymotrypsin has the property that will act on itself, that is, other pi-chymotrypsins like it, okay, to cleave two more peptide, or three more peptide bonds, one between 149 and 148, one between 146 and 147. And no, you're not going to memorize these numbers. Don't worry about that. One between 15 and 16, and one between 13 and 14. We end up with an, a fully active chymotrypsin at that point, and that fully active chymotrypsin has all three of these chains. My question to you is how do these chains stay together? What do you suppose? It's going to be more than hydrogen bonds. Remember, we're in, a, we're in the environment of the intestine, pretty nasty place. Disulfide bonds. We have to have something strong to hold this thing together. And of course, there are disulfide bonds that are, that are already in place in here. So that when we make these cuts, these little pieces fall out. And we're left behind with the big pieces that are then active. What's happening during this cleavage is we're actually opening up the active site. Prior to the cleavage, the active site is closed. It can't uh, bind to other things. But the active site gets opened up by these cleavages that I'm describing here. And when that happens, you end up with uh, the uh, chymotrypsin being fully active. OK. There's the conformational change um, that happens. And you can see in the case of chymotrypsin, the active form in blue, the chymotrypsinogen, the, the inactive form in red. Part of the cleavage is removing this cover okay, here, 
we also see a, a sort of a shape change that happens as a result of that that now allows the opening of this so that we can get into the active site. Right? So we're seeing opening up of the uh, chymotrypsin to allow the substrates to make it into the active site. Well, you said, but wait, Kevin, uh, trypsin was also made as a trypsinogen. So how does trypsinogen get activated? Ultimately, don't we have to have something that activates everything so that we're all set? And in fact, we do. Uh, this thing called enteropeptidase, which has its own regulation, which I won't talk about, ultimately is responsible for activating trypsinogen to trypsin. And you can see trypsin activates a lot of things here, a lot of things. OK. So by the way, this is a protease, chymotrypsin going to a trypsinogen to tr trypsin. Elastase is a protease, OK? Carboxypeptidase is a protease. But this guy breaks down fat. Lipase is a f an enzyme that breaks down fat. It's also made in an inactive form. OK. Now. It's time to talk about inhibitors of proteases. Our cells and our body, as I said, are control freaks. They want to control okay, what, um, um, what, what's going on, basically. Trypsin is a very powerful enzyme. It can really do a lot of damage. So being able to control trypsin with an inhibitor is something that sort of makes logical sense for <coughs> for uh, a cell. There's an inhibitor of trypsin that's known as alpha-1, and this is something you should know, an alpha-1 antitrypsin. It's a peptide. It binds to trypsin and basically plugs up its active site, kind of like you've seen before, so that the enzyme can't act on anything. It's pretty good at knocking out trypsin. Okay? Yes. It's, uh, Alpha-1 antitrypsin is a protein that inhibits the activity of trypsin. Okay? Alpha-1 antitrypsin. Now, it's a very misnamed inhibitor, unfortunately. Because when it was discovered, it was discovered as an inhibitor of trypsin. And it does, in fact, inhibit trypsin. All right? However, it turns out that this, this inhibitor inhibits other proteases as well, and one of them is significant from a human health perspective. Okay? So one of the enzymes that alpha-1 antitrypsin inhibits is the enzyme elastase. Elastase is also a protease. Okay? In fact, in studies, it looks like alpha-1 antitrypsin probably plays a bigger role in inhibiting elastase than it does in inhibiting trypsin. Okay? just for your information. But we still call it alpha-1 antitrypsin. Well, why is it significant from a human health perspective? To tell you that, I need to tell you a little bit about what's going on in your lungs. Okay? Your lungs are an interesting place. All right? In your lungs, you are breathing in every bacterium known to man. Probably never thought about that, but just by one breath that you're taking in, you're sucking in a lot of bacteria that are going into your lungs. Your lungs are a front line of defense against outside invaders. Okay? Well, one of the protections that you have against those outside invaders are proteases. And one of the proteases that you have is elastase. Okay? So elastase is sitting there in your lungs. And it is, in fact, um, when, it, when it's active and when it encounters uh, something that it can chew up, it chews it up. It helps to protect you against some of these invaders that are coming in from outside. Okay? So elastase is very useful in that sense. Okay? Well, elastase has a yin and a yang associated with it because elastase can also attack lung tissue. So what we have to start thinking about is a balance. We want to have enough elastase active that we can knock out the bacterial cells and viruses and so forth that we're breathing in, but not so much that they damage our lung tissue. Because if we have too much elastase active, we develop emphysema. We develop emphysema. Okay? So having the proper balance of active elastase in our lungs is important. And now we start to see where alpha-1 antitrypsin plays an important role. Okay? Now, 
there's other implications to this, and that is what you see on the screen right here. Okay? It turns out that the binding site of alpha-1 antitrypsin for elastase has a critical methionine side chain that's involved in the binding. A critical methionine side chain in alpha-1 antitrypsin is necessary to bind to elastase. Everybody got that? That side chain is readily oxidized in smokers. Okay? When it gets oxidized, this guy in alpha-1 antitrypsin will prevent alpha-1 antitrypsin from binding to elastase. Now we've started upsetting the balance of how much elastase we've got active. Guess why smokers have more emphysema? Exactly. Okay? That balance in the lungs is completely upset by the smoking because alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is normally there doing this balancing act very nicely for us and protecting us, is upset by the oxidation that's happening right here. Okay, so that's alpha-1 antitrypsin and another one of my lectures about why people should not smoke. <laughs> it's one of my crusades. Questions about that? Does everybody understand that mechanism? Everybody can tell me on an exam why smoking leads you to emphysema? So what happens is smokers have a higher, it's a good question, uh, smokers because of the fact they're actually smoking, so the smoke is full of reactive oxygen species, and the reactive oxygen species have oxygens with unpaired electrons, and those unpaired electrons are what's leading to this oxidation right here. So um, many, many problems associated with smoking and uh, reactive oxygen species. We'll talk about a few more of those uh, actually next term. But the bottom line is you want to avoid those reactive oxygen species because they, they're, they're the problem. They are radicals, yes. Yep. Other questions? You guys are a quiet group today. If you don't ask questions, I'm going to go on and talk about blood clotting. All the gory stuff today, right? Emphysema to blood clotting. Is that the only thing that causes oxidation is the uh, radical oxygen? It, are radical oxygen the only things that cause oxidation? Um, they're the primary forms that are implicated in that process, yes. Question? Is alpha-1 uh, antitrypsin a suicide inhibitor? Is alpha-1 antitrypsin a suicide inhibitor? It is not a suicide inhibitor. It's a reversible... Uh, inhibition that can occur. And that's important, again, for this balance that's necessary. Sometimes you want to have the thing come off so you can actually make the, uh, or let the elastase be active and do its thing. Okay. Well, um, the last of the zymogens that I want to talk about today um, are involved in another very, very important process. I won't finish this today, but I will get started on it. And that is the phenomenon of blood clots. Blood clotting is, from a molecular perspective, to me, a fascinating process, absolutely fascinating process. Blood clotting is essential because if we don't clot our blood, we get the smallest cut, we will bleed to death. Okay? And people who um, have um, uh, hemophilia, um, who have a, a blood clotting diseases, have problems with um, being able to clot, and they do bleed to death. Okay? Our blood has to be set up so that we have flowing through it all the time the ability to clot and the ability to clot very quickly in the order of minutes, but we don't want that very quick clotting to take off when we don't want it to because if so, we'll plug up veins and art, we'll plug up arteries that lead to blood supply to our brain or heart and we've got a problem. So when we start thinking about balance now, Clotting versus not clotting is another very, very important consideration. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about balance. That's not my most important message here. My most important message is to show you how the plot, the plot, the plotting process, the clotting process occurs, okay, rapidly, and then how clots are ultimately removed because both of them obviously have important human health <coughs> human health considerations. Well, this shows a pretty hairy scheme. And no, we're not going to memorize this scheme. We're really going to focus right down here at the bottom. 
Okay? The scheme is trying to show us at the protein level a series of activations that are occurring and the, these activations are leading to something that forms a blood clot. The blood clot is actually formed by this compound here called fibrin. Now, our blood is loaded with all of these proteins. And it's loaded with these proteins in an inactive zymogenic form. That is, they're zymogens. A wound or damage of some sort results in the conversion of an, of an inactive zymogen into an active enzyme. That in turn causes another inactive zymogen to get converted to an active enzyme. In turn, another, 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 another. We see this as bang, 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 bang going through here. The analogy I like to make are, the, are, are waterfalls. If you hike in the Cascades, you see waterfalls. If you follow the water down the Cascades, by the time you get to the bottom, you discover that you're now at a river because all these different cascading waterfalls have all come together and coalesced into one. That's literally what's happening in the blood clotting scheme. The other nice thing about a, about a cascading system like this is activation of a handful of these guys. This is factor 12 right here. Activation of a handful of factor 12. Factor 12 is an enzyme. It's going to activate hundreds of these. Now hundreds of these are going to activate thousands of these. At every step of the cascade, we see amplification in terms of numbers. So what's happening literally is we're amplifying a very small signal into a very large response and it's happening very quickly. The clot is being made as a polymer of these guys right here. And so you know from your chemistry classes that making of polymers requires monomers. And when you're making plastic, for example, it requires millions of them. It requires many thousands of these guys to make a functional blood clot. And the amazing thing about the functional blood clot is it's watertight. The body is making a watertight polymer in the order of minutes after this process has started starting from completely soluble precursors. The blood clot itself is precipitating out of solution. Everything else in that blood system, all those other proteins that are floating around in there are completely soluble. Okay? All right. I think that's a good a place to stop right there. I will stop there and we'll tell, talk more about blood clotting next time. about the, sure. the, the tests that give it back to you on Friday? Uh, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll return them all to the BB office at the same time when, I, when I've looked at them. Okay, okay. So I just okay. get it on BB office. You'll get BB office later, yeah. Okay? Thank you. How are you doing?